maybe same code of contact, uh, a slide about the goals of the uh, IRTF, and the charter of the Gaia group, the objectives from the web page. Haven't changed them since the beginning, so it might look maybe a bit needing for an update. And then there is the um, the agenda, as we we had it like uh, yesterday. And then what well, the presentations. And yeah, there is a reminder in the chat from Colin that uh, please uh, masks are required in the meeting room. And Landro, should we um, should we just get started? Given we've got um, some of our presenters with us. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, uh, we all remember <laughs> the content. So, uh, so the first thing is the Node Well uh, document that is common to all IRT, uh, IETF and IRTF meetings. Um, and I'm going to read in detail. You, you will find it in the data tracker. Um, but it's not different from other meetings. And then there is a privacy and code of contact that you have to follow. You basically work res respectfully with others. And, um, and the code of conduct and the anti-harassment procedures. You know the IITF is, is slightly different from the IETF because we focus on, on long-term research issues, um, whereas IETF is more focused on, on short-term and, um, and that we conduct research and we are not an standards development organization. We can also publish RFC documents and but there's some additional information in case you're interested. Uh, and particularly, specifically about the Gaia group. Um, so you see the charter uh, mentions a study from Internet Society from 10 years ago, but the situation hasn't changed uh, quantitatively um, or qualitatively enough um, to make this charter uh, out of date. It's still um, about half the population is not able to access the internet um, as we they should, as they would need. And then uh, the objectives is about um, the visibility of the issues, about creating a shared vision, regulating collaboration, document experiences and research results as, as we have today in the, in the program and um, document costs and, and develop a perspective about how we can influence the IDF uh, work and and others um, to, to address the problem. And, and this is the agenda. So this is what we are doing now, uh, the, the first bullet point. And by, by the way, one of the points is, uh, is the minutes uh, taker. Is there anyone willing to, to do that? Um, given that in addition, the tool allows multiple writers. So is there anyone? Uh, without exclusive access to, to take some notes. It will help us to produce the minutes later. So if you want to, um, there's a website, uh, which is this, uh, notes ITF, you can access with your uh, ITF login. 
And then uh, this is the starting point from the minutes. So if anyone is interested uh, locally or remotely, um, I, I copied in the chat the URL, although it doesn't, oh yeah, it's already there. Okay, so so that's uh, that's all from my side. Um, so perhaps we can move to the first um, presentation, unless there is any other comment from the from the co-chairs. Do you want to? Just want one comment. Yes. Yeah, one comment, um, Leander. Sorry, hello everyone. I think it, um, maybe we could have Curtis introduce himself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Sure, great. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, some of you uh, have met me before. Uh, I've been to a few IDFs at this point. Um, my name is Curtis Heimerl. I'm uh, an assistant professor, uh, soon to be associate professor at the University of Washington, uh, where I've been working on internet access, uh, global internet access for a really long time, um, deploying networks in uh, many remote rural parts of the world, uh, including in partnership with some folks who are talking, particularly FLIP at the University of the Philippines. Uh, I guess uh, no longer at the University of the Philippines, I guess you're at DOST. Um, uh, and even here, uh, we just deployed a network up in the Canadian Arctic uh, and uh, run the Seattle Community Network with a bunch of folks. Um, and so I'm uh, joining up uh, as uh, a Gaia chair after uh, participating in many, many Gaias at this point. Um, I think my first one was uh, at uh, the NSDR in like 2010 when Arjuna was, uh, was one of the chairs. So uh, I'm really excited to be here and to contribute back to this community. Mm -hmm. I see Colin is in the queue as well as Ben, I suppose Ben is- Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, very briefly thank uh, Curtis for being willing to, to step up to this this, this role. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, re really good uh, that he's doing that and uh, I'd like to, to welcome him and uh, ho hope for many more productive years in, in the Gaia group. Thank you so much, Colin. And in order to keep the, the number of co-chairs uh, an even number, then uh, my plan is to step down uh, after this meeting. Um, so, um, well, thank you very much for all, everyone that um, made these meetings uh, possible and, and the great contributions. I will keep participating in Gaia, so it's simply I'm change, changing uh, position in the room. So I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face, hopefully soon. So, uh, the first thing again, thank you, uh, Leandro, for, for very many, many years of, of service to the group. Uh, I, I very much do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. I learned so much, and it's like a, a great. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope Curtis will enjoy as well as as I did. Okay, so then, then uh, I'm going to give you screen access, uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen that I think is required. Thank you. All right, I'm just uh, changing my screen. So hmm. now we can see your screen. Yes. Okay. So I'm change to my view to the full and what do you think, Leandro? Should we give Peng a two-minute warning close to the time, or should we set the timer? Every speaker has about 20 minutes, and then we have Q&A. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my screen well. Uh, if you have uh, some issues of not sh seeing the screen, please let me know. So um, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, today's topic of my presentation um, about satellite integrated community networks. And I will talk about the, um, the management gap that are existing in, the, in this uh, paradigm. I will talk about with autonomous maintainability. 
So just a brief introduction to myself. I'm a uh, adjunct professor at uh, the Sheridan School of Computer Science, as well as the Department of uh, Stats and Curial uh, Science at uh, the University of Waterloo, Canada. I'm also uh, a research officer in Digital Technologies Research Center at National Research, research Council Canada. So here's the outline of, uh, of my presentation. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the broadband gap that can be bridged with uh, the advanced satellite networks. And then uh, I would talk about the uh, satellite integrated community networks and followed by the management gap identified uh, and also the autonomous maintainability as a important step to realizing the uh, the management challenge existing in the SICS. And I will give a proof of concept in terms of a case study and will make a conclusion at the end. So just to give us a, um, a quick updated view of uh, the current two large low Earth orbit satellites in uh, short animations, what we can see that is the, uh, um, they are actually, sorry, I think there are some issues right here. Oops. Maybe I have to uh, bear with me for a second. I have to uh, bring it back somehow. Sorry about interruption. I think there's a there's some issue uh, about video playing of the system. Anyway, so we can see that there are two uh, um, low Earth orbit satellite constellations that are up and running in our outer space of Earth. And what you just saw is the animation which runs faster, 28 times faster than its normal speed. And what we can see here is that the LEO satellites in these constellations are moving and they can have global coverage. So in this slide, we can see some examples of the advanced satellite platforms and their recent revamped interest for satellite communications actually results from the reduced cost for space launches and enhanced capability of hardware platforms that makes the broadband satellite internet possible. And for those examples, uh, we can see they are actually nano and small satellites uh, as small as a shoe box size or, um, uh, and, or either very lightweight as we see from the example from uh, SpaceX Starlink constellation as well as the Telesat uh, satellite constellations. Both are very representative uh, uh, satellite constellations. And um, they will form a network in large or mega constellations in space when they're fully launched. And the median Earth orbit satellites and the geo satellites are also gets enhanced recently. So there are two examples shown here. One is the SES high throughput satellite with um, 30,000 steerable beams supporting 50 megabytes per second to 10 gigabits per second data rate. And the other one is the Immersat very high throughput geo satellite. So with those advanced uh, systems, of course, there are other enabling technologies on the user terminal side as well with all those uh, innovations and improvements that are made uh, to the satellite communication systems, we can actually now um, provide very high quality internet connection to the rural and remote communities. And we can see that it has, satellite networks has long been a key connectivity option for community networks on a global scale. And in the report, uh, of broadband coverage in Europe 2017, satellite broadband is considered the most pervasive technology in Europe, Europe in terms of the overall coverage. And we can see other uh, similar you know, coverage and, and cases 
uh, around other places of the world. And the development of the satellite networking technology also matched the uh, recent developments um, over the uh, different technical communities. For example, 3GPP has been looking at the integration of LEO satellites or non-terrestrial networks into the 5G and the beyond infrastructure. And the Internet Society in this year's uh, annual plan, they have uh, also mentioned uh, the exploration of uh, looking at LEO satellites for community networks or satellite networks. So with the international efforts on closing the broadband gap for digital divide, including the implementation of new satellite networks and the telecommunications infrastructures in rural and remote areas, a traditional satellite dependent community networks or SDCNs are envisioned to be trans transforming into a uh, satellite integrated CN, SICN, featuring a integration of heterogeneous networks and segments to provide broadband resilient and agile end-to-end -end connections. As a example, simple example shown he here, uh, we can see this SICN architecture in different parts. For example, the edge, uh, backhaul, and the backbone segments between CN users and service providers. And the CNs are connected to the edge or access network with at least a satellite front end and the backhaul links provided by uh, the, um, the satellite itself. And also it has optional terrestrial network connections uh, uh, which were all connected to the backbone of the internet, including the service providers. Um, so the edge and the backhaul portions represent the most possible places where force actually. Uh, types, for example, fixed networks uh, like copper or cable and fiber optical uh, options and wireless networks, including cellular and microwave options, so on and so forth. This is the geographical view of SDCNs where the blue dots denote the communities with satellite connectivity in Canada and the US based on the 2020 National Broadband Data Canada and the ACS Internet Connectivity Data in the US. This view shows the SDCNs are uh, scattered over the continent, which also gives us a view or indication where the satellite independent community networks can be based on. So talking about the SICN paradigm, we will realize there are uh, many technical challenges. And how to ensure, for example, how to ensure the performance metrics and different service level agreements in terms of the latency data rates, reliability, as well as the fairness uh, is very important. And it can also introduce the complexity in communication and computation, for example, with the introduction of space assets with high dynamics in terms of velocity, access states in routes and the signal propagation impairments caused by atmospheric conditions and system heterogeneity in payloads, how to ensure a reliable and resilient communication is important. And the new computing scenarios will emerge as well. Um, because we have different nodes in space, air, and the ground components, and how to use those nodes to uh, facilitate some new computation uh, paradigms or scenarios. Um, for example, nowadays, the, uh, the satellites are using software-defined radios, and also they're going to employ the software-defined networking technologies, and that, well, really gives us a really interesting discussions about the new architectures in computing. And also with the increasing adoption of AI algorithms in networking, the data will be a challenging part to resolve for SICNs. Due to the fact that some parts of the management data, for example, in satellite uh, networks parts may be scarce. 
And of course, there are security challenges as well, where vulnerabilities can occur in different network infrastructural uh, segments and protocols and algorithms running on top of that will be a challenge in design. And we also have the network management considered as a big challenge uh, as well, especially the, the, when the network gets more complex, where maintenance, resource management, and orchestration for different parts of the integrated network need to be done efficiently. And also, uh, the governance model will get changed, uh, or we need to put more thoughts into the, into the model based on the multi-stakeholder model that internet has been based on. And because we have multiple stakeholders uh, in, the, uh, in the model, such as network operators, community users, uh, stakeholders, and service providers, et cetera. And now I'm gonna focus on the, uh, talking about the management gap that are existing for SICNs as we are uh, trying to bridging the broadband gap, which is now possible uh, nowadays with the technologies and uh, connecting options right now, where there is a hidden or um, management gap in community networks that needs to be addressed, especially for SICNs, where the autonomous maintainability is an essential step to achieving this goal. Due to the fact that, that the community users often suffer from the, uh, the poor maintenance efforts or responsive maintenance efforts, and also there's a lack of technical support always in there. So the autonomous maintainability or self-maintainability can be viewed as a capability to monitor and diagnose itself and maintain its functions in case of failures or performance degradation. And we have seen that there are relevant discussions from different organizations, such as the standards, different uh, development organizations from ITUT, ETSI, and also uh, ourselves, IETF. So the concept uh, now, so uh, talking about self-maintenance, uh, I would like to propose a hierarchical approach to that. So here, the concept of this approach uh, is shown in this diagram. There are basically two parts of the diagram. One is the, uh, uh, on top is the uh, machine learning pipeline. And uh, the other part is the hierarchical view of how those results get introduced uh, to help with the anomaly identification uh, step. And then once we identify the anomalies uh, correctly and efficiently, we can uh, execute some anomaly mitigation schemes specific to the SICMs. So overall, the machine learning based uh, multi-class classification problem will be formulated as a unified way of handling network intrusions, faults, detections, localizations, as well as service system reliability analysis for the anomaly identification phase. And the features extracted from the network flows can be used to uh, predict the network states where the multiple network anomalies caused by different factors can be considered. And the class labels uh, represent the states in the data sets. So the states uh, of, uh, of the network can be normal or abnormal states, or it can be extended into multiple fine-grained states. Depends on the applications. So illustratively, the self-maintenance process I'm talking about can be split into three phases, identification, planning, and execution. And we can see in the presence of a good mitigation scheme that can be provided by a backup connection during the time period for repairs, the time taken for anomaly identification denoted by T right here is important. The less time, the better. Now comes to the uh, kind of a proof of concept setup, because we wanted to know if or how the machine learning algorithm can help with a uh, self-maintenance scenario following the hierarchical approach design. In this case, we set up a uh, SICN in a emulated environment uh, where satellite entities and routers are based on the mini-net uh, virtual machines 
and satellite and the fixed connection backholes labeled as N0 and N1 um, are connected to an SICN, including three communities on the very left, represented by local networks N5 to N7, and the backbone, backbone service provider networks N2 to N4 are shown on the right. And N5 represent an uh, SICN setup with cellular distribution, and N6 represents the classic, uh, the traditional SDCN setup, and N7 represents another SICN setup with the connection diversity provided by satellite and fixed connections. And each router here were added to each network as an autonomous system to generate and log BGP traffic because it's very uh, representative traffic. Uh, we wanted to know, uh, to see the potentials of whether we can use that for, um, for these self-maintenance uh, case study. And the traffic flows from the service provider to uh, community network and users are through N1 to N0. Just to show the brief experimental results, the table on the left shows the, um, uh, indicates that uh, there are promising uh, machine learning algorithms available. Uh, so there are generally are uh, recurrent neural network methods and example methods. Specifically, there are GRU and LSTM uh, for RNN models and uh, XGBoost and RF random forest uh, for the ensemble method in machine learning. And also we can see that with the hierarchical approach where we uh, exper experimented with the public network intrusion data as well as our own um, generated data through that network emulation for BGP traffic, uh, we can see that, that there are uh, performance uh, improvements by using the hierarchical approach as shown in the pipeline in the previous slide. So all, for the, all those uh, you know, top performing uh, machine learning methods, they can all have uh, the improvements in terms of accuracy, the, in terms of the key performance metrics such as accuracy, F1 score, and the training time. So here I also added the BLS broad, uh, broad learning system as a comparison, because this is also uh, one of the uh, promising top performing methods. For conclusion, uh, we can see that community networks are expected to have increasing integration with the space and terrestrial components brought by the advanced satellite networks and the communication in the form of satellite integrated community networks, SICNs. And SICN as a paradigm um, can provide a promising configuration for leveraging not only space component, but also uh, ground and air uh, setups. And the proposed machine learning based hierarchical approach to autonomous maintenance for SICN management shows some promising results, although there are going to be some uh, room for uh, future uh, contributions for sure. And uh, for this presentation, uh, the major reference is from the uh, reference one, uh, although all major uh, other references are listed right here. Thank you very much. Oops, Thank you. Sorry, you're right on time. Yeah, go for it, no, Leandro. Sure, Jane, please. <laughs> Uh, do, are there any questions for Peng? That was fabulous. I see Rajiv and Philippe are on the, they're in the queue, but I think you're speaking after Peng. So do, does anyone, um, does anyone have a question for Peng? Uh, Philippe, you do? Are you uh, at all concerned about the space? Uh, if I can jump in uh, for Peng. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Peng. Uh, this is basically uh, going back, I think, to uh, slide seven or eight of your presentation, where you showed us a broadband map, coverage map. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, it's slide eight, correct? Uh, not seven. Uh, where you talked of the coverage across North America and you showed, uh, you know, the general 
distribution of satellite terminals and SDCNs. So uh, I found I found one thing very surprising. Um, mm -hmm. Canada, uh, you know, being an extremely uh, you know sparsely populated uh, region, I would expect to have had a lot more uh, you know SDCNs being deployed over there because of the vast distances involved. And even in the United States, uh, you know, the Midwest and the mountain regions seem to have like big gaps in them uh, where you'd expect a lot of rural communities to be there. And uh, they are kind of ideal locations for satellite based uh, bandwidth to go in. But we're seeing a lot of concentration on the coasts and in the more densely populated areas. So do you have any idea as to why this kind of distribution is there? Or is it some anomaly of the specific data set that was used to calculate these uh, yeah. points? Yes. S thanks very much for, for your question. That's really uh, depends on the data sets I'm using uh, right there, because there are two data sets are actually dropped from two countries. Um, so they have different uh, magnitude, basically, and a scare. So in the U.S., I actually filtered out the uh, some of the um, communities with the user less than 99 uh, households. So that's why maybe you didn't see a lot of dance the dots across the country because of that. Because in Canada, the data scale is different. They're not uh, measured by the households; they're measured by the communities, the geographical size. That's where so that maybe the one of the dots represents uh hundreds of thousand people over there yeah so so um, uh, that's fine thing my question is more on the lines of you'd expect that the east and west coast in the us because of their population density will have a much higher uh, you know distribution of terrestrial networks and fixed fixed and fixed wireless net networks available mm -hmm. so you would expect there to be a corresponding uh, decrease in the need for satellite connectivity, but that doesn't seem to be the case, right? The the data is obviously showing something quite different. So I find well, that quite surprising. I wanted your thoughts on that. Yes. So I I would uh, you know this is based on the uh, the data itself. There are some uh, specific descriptions you can check specifically from this paper of uh, that mentions the data source. And also there are different rural areas as well. So not only the remote communities that are really dependent on that. And we should all also realize there are some uh, backbone connections like fiber optical connections are extending into different areas of the country. This is very sim uh, true for the uh, for Canada Northern communities. They are all and, and some parts of the uh, um, uh, Alberta they have some uh, a lot of projects regarding the extension of the fiber optic connections so some of the communities are actually merging into multiple connectivity options so that's where really uh, realistically making the sicn paradigm uh, happen actually okay thank you peng i think this is a, a great point that you're making particularly with what we're seeing about the importance for redundancy and resiliency uh, around the planet and having more than one network available. Um, Rajiv, are you in the queue? Because, uh, sorry, you're out of the queue now. Um, Philip, are you in the queue to, to ask a question of Peng? We want to keep these pretty short so that he could answer a couple more. Great. Um, Curtis, are you in the queue too? So you're up. Uh, and then John Clint after Curtis. So this was a, a great talk. Thank you so much, Peng. I'm going to email you out of band because I was literally in Uluhaktuk, which is one of the dots on here, um, about two weeks ago, installing a community network. Um, and uh, we're really like just trying to figure out when Starlink will get there and how, how important that'll be. Um, I'm curious about a, a couple things. I think this map is interesting because ostensibly there's a community network in there. I can see the dot, uh, but mm -hmm. such a thing doesn't exactly exist. So I think we're using very different or maybe uh, different definitions of uh, these things because there's a Northwest Tel um, satellite link in the village that gets used and uh, everyone complains about. Uh, but the big question I have is uh, about really the overall methodology. I mean, my experience in community networks has been that um, the failure modes are not things that require machine learning to figure out what happened. Uh, you know, unlike situations like Rogers and the other failures that are 
you know, somewhat large and in the central core network, it's almost always just that the power has a problem uh, mm -hmm. or something like that. And so methodologically, what we do is, and we will be doing here soon, is uh, going into the community and running some training courses and teaching people about the technology and teaching people about, hey, that blinky lights off, that means you should probably do something. Um, how does that fit into you all's vision of uh, creating resilient networks in these areas? So uh, yeah, that's a really good point. I noticed that some uh, many community networks are currently set up in a very small scale and, uh, and they have their own different uh, problems. Some are okay with just the traditional way of solving the issues or faults within the network. Some are really correlated to other areas or segments of the network, for example, uh, but they do have common grounds. They do have common grounds in terms that machine learning can be used as a way to automate this process due to the, the lack of technical support, due to the lack of the expectation of responsive maintenance efforts to be done to give them really smooth uh, and uh, uninterrupted internet access experience. So what I imagine is that there, are gonna, uh, there will be some uh, transformation uh, due to the current satellite communications technologies. So, um, but maybe people can see that, okay, they have good connection uh, to the uh, Starlink, for example. I'm not promoting that service anyways, just an example, to have good connection and a good cost-effective uh, uh, package. So for, in terms of that, um, the maintenance is still uh, over there because there are going to be some, uh, a lot of different stakeholders and operators uh, into uh, uh, you know, the service for providing internet connection to the community networks. And the training regarding the community network users will be um, to let them know the options and connective options. Uh, maybe there is no one size fits all right now, but uh, for the broadband connectivity options, which is the major focus of, of my uh, research in this here, uh, that going to be, uh, I think that will really need some uh, technological advancements in there. Did I, did I answer your questions or? or uh, Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. We have about, about three to four more minutes for questions for Peng because we have some other great speakers in the queue. So John Clinton, I see you have a hand up and you've been patiently waiting and Nabil Benamar, um, I think we're gonna have to lock the queue after Nabil. So if we could do a quick round with Peng and Peng, um, if we could keep our answers a little short so that we can also um, and let's make sure we have your email so that we can, if you don't mind putting it in the chat, so folks could contact you because this was a really great presentation. And Curtis, I want to put on the clipboard your point about the definition of CNs because that could be something we look at for the next meeting. So John Clinton, you're up. Question for Peng. Are, are you uh, concerned about the impact this work may have on the, uh, on the space junk, on encouraging more of these satellites and consequently, the space junk problem, or uh, or is that something you're just assuming somebody else is worried about? Exactly, the space junk is one of the big concern. Uh, I'm doing the research actually on that area because um, that really uh, the environmental uh, space environmental issues is 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 a big concern for uh, for humanity, and we have seen that though uh, some you know some activities have been done from a European Space Agency and globally, actually, gradually. And, but we are glad to see that uh, it's happening. But of sh for sure, uh, the space junk needs to be taken care of at an early stage before it's getting worse. Thank you, Peng. That's great. Nabil Benamar. Uh, a well-known uh, colleague in the IETF. Nabil, over to you for a question for Peng. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I'd like um, to ask you just a, a question about the simulation setup, maybe, because you have mentioned that you use the mini net with VMs. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that it can cause some uh, issue when we, you want to scale uh, to uh, to, to use a lot of, uh, of, of, of nodes. 
So me, mini net has a limit because of the RAM and uh, all uh, the stuff. So I'm asking about this and uh, uh, suggesting if uh, you can f for further work, for future work to use, for example, the Linux uh, uh, namespace. Linux namespace, you can go to thousands of nodes without any uh, uh, problem related to, uh, to scale. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comments. I, I do realize there is a limitation in terms of uh, compute resources consumed by MediaNet VMs, yes. And we really wanted to scale up. Uh, maybe uh, thanks for your suggestion. Peng, this was a really great presentation. Thank you for such a, an interesting approach and all the great questions that everyone's been asking. And if you don't mind, I think everybody would love probably your contact information if you could pop it in the chat. Um, we yeah. just want to make sure you're the person doing that rather than me or yeah, sure. from a privacy perspective. Cool. All right, Leandro, who do we have up next? Just checking the agenda. It looks like we have um, Philip Martinez, Resilient Education Information Infrastructure for the new uh, for the new normal. Philip, over Thank to you. you. Um, uh -huh. Can you see my slides? Not yet. It says it's being started. Okay. I think you should um, see my screen right now. Um, I cannot uh, see the- I still do not. Jane or Leandro, do either of you? Not yet. There's a bit of not a yet. delay. Okay. There is a message saying that the screen share is being started, but it hasn't yet appeared. Okay. Um, let me just, I think this is a struggle for us. Oops. That one. Yeah. Yep, I see slides now. OK. Um, I'll just enlarge this one. Um, good evening from the Philippines. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, it is great to um, present flip, here flip. at the Well, We lost slides. OK. So, uh, oopsie. Back to being started. It was good there for a moment. There we go. It's back. Okay. I'll. Um, uh, I, 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 okay. So um, again, um, hi everyone. Um, uh, pleased to me, uh, meet you here, right? Virtually, um, I'm Philip Martinez from the Philippines. I'm affiliated with now with the Department of Science and Technology, Advanced Science and Technology Institute, and I serve as the technical lead of this project, uh, Resilient mm -hmm. Education Information Infrastructure for New Normal. Okay. Um, in this presentation, I will uh, give you the overview of the project, its rationale, our technology demonstrators, um, the perceived um, social and economic impacts of this project, our pilot sites, and our current implementation challenges. So um, in the Philippines, um, on the onset of the pandemic, uh, we, have, we, we have been forced to shift from uh, the traditional in-person classes to remote and online learning um, classes. Uh, this um, brought some serious problems because uh, we still have this lack of quality, uh, reliable, sustainable, and resilient ICT infrastructure. And this remains as a top challenge in the implementation of remote and hybrid learning in the Philippines. So the problem is that we had uh, difficulties in educational content transmission in remote learning due to the unreliable internet connection in the Philippines. As you can see in the slide, those teachers are actually um, um, in their arms, in their cell phones, uh, searching for a signal. 
So the challenge that uh, uh, we are taking on at the OSTST is to develop innovative solutions uh, utilizing UHF TV channels to provide internet connectivity and to support uh, remote education in the Philippines. So again, Project Rain, the focus of this project is to develop um, the solutions that uses um, UHF TV channels to support remote education and to provide um, internet connectivity since face-to-face -face classes is still limited in the Philippines. Um, we haven't opened their schools yet. So uh, why UHF TV frequencies? Uh, the Philippines has yet to fully shift uh, from analog TV to digital TV, and it's pegged at uh, 2023. So there is an opportunity for us to champion for alternative use of to do to uh, to the to, to be vacated spectrum, specifically at 600 megahertz to 700 megahertz. Uh, for 600 megahertz, we are eyeing these frequencies for both um, LTE and new radio band uh, 71, which could be used by alternative connectivity strategies such as community networks. And um, uh, we could also use this for the ISDBT um, standard, which the which is the digital TV standard we allow in the Philippines uh, to implement data casting test broadcasts. In our recent survey uh, regarding the use of ICT uh, devices in the Philippines last 2019, um, TV and smartphones are almost ubiquitous still in the Philippines, where 78.9% of uh, Filipino households have working TV sets, and 40.9% of uh, these households are within reach of digital TV signals, while 82.64% uh, primarily access the internet here in the Philippines through our smartphones. So um, we have uh, two technology demonstrators, that, that's what we call them for Project RAIN, uh, utilizing the uh, 600 to 700 meg um, frequencies. The first is local LTE or the local LTE, which is uh, aims to develop a low cost, um, small scale LTE based station uh, that aims to address the lack of internet access in remote and unserved areas in the country. Uh, this technology demonstrator builds upon the gains of an earlier project, the village based station, uh, program wherein uh, we piloted community cellular networks uh, offering 2G calls and texts. Uh, the second technology demonstrator is rural casting, wherein we utilize the data casting feature of the ISDBT standard uh, to deliver educational digital content. Because right now, uh, we only utilize the ISDBT to deliver uh, broad broadcast content. And we see that uh, we can uh, use the ISDBT more and um, transmit uh, more meaningful information. Again, uh, let's focus on the first uh, technology de demonstrator first. So here is the uh, system overview of uh, local LTE. Um, uh, 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 the radio access network and the core network is co-located at uh, in one box. Uh, uh, the user equipment. Uh, the subscriber needs to have a SIM card that uh, is compatible with the network. And uh, once you have the user equipment and the SIM card and you are within the um, network coverage of the network, you can access the um, locally uh, locally cached or locally uh, stored educational materials, cached content, and local portals. Uh, for, the compute, uh, for the radio access network and the core network, uh, uh, we host the LTE network monitoring control, subscriber management, and uh, for this segment, uh, we are using um, an SDR and uh, we are fitting a um, band 71 RF front end. And um, we connect this to the internet, which could uh, uh, be any technology, but uh, for the areas that we are piloting it, uh, we are using um, a satellite backhole. So, um, once we connect it to the internet, the subscribers can um, access the internet. Uh, but without it, uh, the subscribers can only access the uh, locally cast content like uh, videos and um, uh, other educational materials. Uh, for rural casting, uh, the goal is to uh, utilize, again, data casting technology to supplement the educational experience of the students. Uh, you can see here in the slide the prototype of the um, Rural casting receiver, wherein uh, they are receiving the broadcast at the same time. They um, uh, at the background, the um, data casted file is being saved by uh, by the device. So again, the system overview is that um, 
we have a set of box wherein uh, it could be used as a standalone device, but it also is a Wi-Fi hotspot wherein other devices can connect to it. And the setup box um, hosts a um, an, an LMS like a Moodle, and it also hosts uh, various apps from our partners, uh, especially um, applications involving the teaching of mathematics, uh, financial education, uh, financial inclusion, and um, uh, other specialized um, educational materials. Now uh, we envision that our teachers in the schools or in the rural areas can have their mini transmitters or mini TV transmitters so they can conduct remote classes in their schools wherein the transmitters are located and the students that have their setup boxes in their homes can uh, continue learning at the comfort of their homes. So the teachers are uh, pegged as content creators wherein they can upload modules, videos, and others and they can use the mini SDR based mini transmitters in their school to schedule content and to schedule the um, uh, the data or the uh, other information that could be data casted uh, during the broadcast. So we envision that uh, these two technology demonstrators uh, uh, will have these uh, four social impacts, better connectivity, um, access to information, health literacy. Um, in the context of a pandemic, uh, we need to uh, provide um, verified health information to uh, to these areas and number four a uh, better learning experience uh, we also take note of the potential economic impacts of these technology demonstrators uh, additional revenue for the community eliminating some market barriers uh, maximizing market yields uh, attract investors and uh, uh, number five is that uh, we acknowledge that uh, uh, the problems in the community are unique to the community and they could read innovation with the tools that we have and uh, we could empower the uh, the uh, the community members to solve their own problems and to breed innovation and the sixth impact is the uh, more education uh, more educated uh, workforce so we will um, uh, show you some of our pilot sites uh, we had a set criteria on how to select our pilot sites for this project. Uh, number one is the absence of commercial mobile phone service. A school that is not more than 500 meters away from the community with at least 50 households. Uh, school officials and members of the community are willing to participate are participate and cooperate in the project. And no, one, uh, no ongoing uh, armed conflict. Um, uh, availability of passable roads, uh, stable, reliable electric power from the local utility, utility and um, some open space to host our towers. So uh, one of our pilot sites is, is San Andres Tanay Rizal. It's a two-hour um, ride from the capital Manila, but it has no cellular signal service because um, of uh, geographical challenges. Uh, the other pilot is for our one of our technology demonstrators, Royal Casting. It's uh, a nearby town from San Andres. And the um, second pilot for our, uh, local LTE is um, in Zambales, wherein uh, they also had difficulty in having cellular service. In fact, uh, in that picture, that is the only spot in the community wherein they could receive um, SMS messages. So we are targeting uh, six other pilot communities and nomination of these communities is through data crowdsourcing wherein we post uh, uh, a status on Facebook and we would verify the information that was sent to us through uh, various sources. So um, here are just uh, some action pictures of the team uh, performing spectral measurements and verifications of site surveys. Uh, our preliminary testing of our technology demonstrators in one of the communities in um, Tanay Rizal. Uh, here is a um, technology demonstration of for our teachers and our students using their smartphones. Um, this is also a picture of technology demonstrator uh, aimed at the community, uh, not just the students, but uh, the subscri potential subscribers of the network. Uh, here are some groundbreaking activity. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, groundbreaking activities is a big thing because um, it um, signifies the start of a project and a start of something uh, um, beneficial to the community. 
And here are some finished uh, towers uh, for San Andres and um, Zambales. Uh, the other, uh, the one of the tower is hosted at, 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 at top of the building of the school while the other is on the ground. So uh, currently, uh, we are in talks with our regulator uh, for our limited permits in these select pilot areas. And we are hoping for policy changes or recommendations for uh, government entities such as um, DOST uh, performing quasi-telco functions because right now, um, importation of um, telco equipment, using of frequencies, um, that functions are exclusive uh, for our telco companies. And with that, uh, we had a restricted ability uh, to import um, LTE Band 71, commercial of the shelf radios, and end user devices. So we had to um, uh, resort to building our own RF front end using, uh, uh, and using um, software defined radios. And we also have an apparent redundancy uh, with the free Wi Fi program for all of uh, the Philippines, wherein um, uh, uh, another department is installing uh, free uh, Wi Fi hotspots. But we believe that uh, uh, sustainable operational model for community buy in or participative, uh, participative networks is a more uh, suitable option rather than uh, this free Wi Fi that. Uh, that is dependent on subsidies all around. So we want to establish LTE networks wherein the community can, do, can buy in and participate and operate. And um, here's uh, pictures of uh, our team. And uh, with that, I end my presentation. And thank you. Our email is at projectrain.asti.us.gov.ph and you can follow our updates in Facebook at facebook.com slash projectrain. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so we can we can move to the questions. Um, I guess I'm first in the queue again. Um, hi, Philip. Yes, uh, uh, that's an amazing presentation you just gave. Uh, you guys seem to be doing some great work, uh, you know, in the community. And uh, I just wanted to find out if you guys are open to more collaborations uh, because we are, are doing some very similar stuff. Uh, you know, you, you will see that when we present. And uh, we'd love to, you know, just kind of touch base with you and compare notes because uh, I'm, I'm sure each of us will have a lot of learnings from our respective uh, activities in rural communities that you know can become a part of the knowledge base as we you know build towards serving uh, more and more communities worldwide yeah yeah um i think uh, you could uh, leave the email for this for so that um, I will, I uh, will we could um <laughs> uh, start our communication basically um uh this is an opportunity for us to compare notes actually because um uh while the core technology is the same we have different um contexts in our deployments uh, no. so we have we our problems might be similar my problems might not that similar but at least we can compare notes uh what are the best I, i'm pretty sure that the approaches network. we are taking are going to be significantly different because uh we are approaching this from a entirely uh non-governmental um you know uh, mm. angle where we don't really uh, um, we're, we're basically looking at working through an existing telco and stuff like that whereas you're doing a lot through uh, you know government programs and the ability like you said of um, your organization to become like a quasi telco um, on the back of policy uh, you know intervention from the government to allow you to do things uh, quite differently from what we are doing so like i said a lot of opportunity to compare notes Yes, definitely. All right, I'll jump in. I think I'm the next in the queue. Uh, thanks, Flip. Thanks for, for, for jumping in here and being helpful. Uh, just for everyone in the room, uh, worked with Flip for a while. He's one of the best. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you're going to hear me beating the same drum for everyone who will be keep coming to Gaia of technical training. 
using platforms like this. Have, have I know that, that your mandate is kind of education in the school and early uh, childhood, not really that early childhood sense, but like, it, have there been discussions about learning about how the internet works through installations like this and how uh, in order to help sort of build capacity? Um, we have uh, been in talks with um, other groups uh, in the Philippines wherein uh, we really need to have um, an information drive or some materials wherein uh, how to access the internet or how to use the internet for the first time or how to filter uh, the news that you, uh, you receive in Facebook or, or fake news, especially here in the Philippines. Um, other groups that have signified interest to learn, uh, to collaborate with us on that aspect. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. I see still Rajit in the queue. I don't know if you want to. Um, no, I, I'm just joining the queue since I believe we are next in line to present. Okay, okay. Then, um, is there any other question in, in the room or remotely? Any comment? Well, if not, I would say that uh, I was impressed by by how you managed to to combine technology to serve the schools. Uh, it's it's amazing, um, and I'm looking forward to any any data about experiences because I think it's going to be uh, very useful in. in in, in many other locations, so in, in a great, a, a great solution in the context of Gaia. Uh, keep on doing this because it's really amazing. Thank you, thank you, Leandro. Okay, so then thank you so much, and then uh, we we can move to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, N50 uh, digital inclusion pilot at Lumbo, Zambia, by uh, Rajib and and Kevin. Hi, uh, Leandro, if you could authorize my uh, ability to screen share, I will sure. go ahead and. Ah, yes. Uh, I've started it at my end. I hope it's visible to everyone. Yes, it is. It works. Great. Perfect. So let me hand over to uh, Kevin, who will get us started. And I'll come in on the tech side of stuff. Excellent. Thank you, Rajiv, um, and thank you all for having us. Um, I'm Kevin Schwartz of Geeks Without Frontiers, and I help lead the N50 project. And as mentioned, I'm here with Rajiv from PicoNets. We'd like to share with you both the N50 project and the learnings from a specific project in Zambia. Rajiv, could you move us to the next slide? So it's important to know about uh, N50 project in order to understand the work that we're going to talk about in Zambia. Um, N50 Project is a consortium of more than 80 organizations. They're commercial, NGO, academic, and more. This group includes really large international companies such as Intel, Dell, and Philips. It also includes important partners such as PicoNets, telehealth providers, education specialists, and, and even some specific niche providers of specific technologies and services. We believe in a few things. Half the world's population is not currently using the internet and that access is only part of the problem. It could be that it's relatively expensive. It could be poor internet quality. Um, it could be a, a language barrier. It could be a lack of digital literacy, or it could be a lack of relevant applications. And we actually think that last one is, is one of the most important ones that we try to focus on. So in the next slide, we sort of spell out a little bit of our, our values and our mission in this beginning with communities are the source of values and are included from the outset. And while many organizations are motivated by goals to help marginalized communities, no one organization can tackle the challenge alone. Even some of these giant organizations that I mentioned earlier have all said, we're better together. And, and we believe that if we can demonstrate novel replicable solutions using a technology that's available today at the edge, and that these include services that support the adoption of broadband, we can create recipes that other communities can readily utilize. We're not going to be able to solve the challenge alone of 3.9 billion people not currently using the internet, but if we can create these models that, that communities can uh, select and replicate with willing partners, then 
we can get there together. Um, Rajiv, on our next slide, you can see that uh, uh, this is the process that we, we undertake, careful curation of projects uh, that are focused on a sustainable outcome, blueprints for communities, and then matching partners with specific capabilities to the community's needs. Um, overall, we always invite uh, everyone to, to join in 50. It's an open um, uh, collaboration uh, without uh, fees or dues or things like that. It's just simply a coalition of the willing dedicated to this work. And we, we may have 80 partners, but maybe six work on one project and seven on another and two on another. It just depends on, on what the community challenges that we're trying to solve. Um, on the next slide, we can show you a list right now, as of at least yesterday, a list of our partners that we have in our in our consortium. This list is growing uh, at a rate of about two or three per week as as we are uh, uh, engaging with partners to to join. So we have many projects that are underway or emerging around the globe. Our highest profile projects right now include support for Ukrainian refugees and displaced persons, and also our pilot project in Luwembo, Zambia. And that's the focus of our presentation today, where Rajiv will take us shortly to, uh, to talk about how we work to solve the challenge in that community. Uh, this is, uh, Luwembo is a perfect example of what we call the edge. Uh, the location was selected as a way to prove out multiple concepts, knowing that if we were successful in Luombo, the likelihood of success in other communities was actually very high. Rajiv and Pico Nets were heavily involved in this project from the outset. Rajiv, can you share with us what you found in Luombo when you arrived and how did the project proceed? Yes. So uh, one of the biggest challenges that um, you know Kevin already mentioned earlier is that there are a number of factors which may be having an involvement in saying that there's a community that isn't participating in the internet. Uh, it was, we talked about cost, we talked about access to devices, uh, we talked about digital literacy, um, and all of these factors, you know, have some part to play in the challenge being solved. So one of the things that we really wanted to do is uh, pick a community where um, it's reasonably small, reasonably tight knit, which means we can very effectively measure and establish a baseline so that when we start doing different things, different interventions, we can see what kind of impact they're having. So the first stage was obviously working with um, uh, a telco who is covering that area. Um, up until just January of this year, all these people had was 2G and very spotty 3G connectivity. OK, uh, nothing beyond that. Uh, so the first intervention was actually looking at how the community uh, utilization of Internet and services uh, transitions as 4G started moving into the community. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, we collected some of that data, uh, you know, put that together. And then we started taking the next step where we started seeding the community with uh, more devices especially 4G capable devices, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, bringing in devices for uh, targeted communities like the school teachers, okay, or the healthcare workers, and also to uh, bring devices into the general community, um, you know, bring in specialized tablets and computers into the schools, uh, you know, both the sec primary as well as the secondary schools um, in the community. And all of these are things that we are looking at um, with every intervention, we are collecting a lot of data, we're collecting usage trends, because all of this is eventually going to go into our report that will help, like Kevin said, build a template that can be reused by other communities as they look to improve their own connectivity and digital literacy. Um, the next step for us is to actually go uh, and address the content side of the equation. Okay, which is, hey, uh, you now have access, you now have devices, but what are you going to consume with that access and those devices that you have, right? So uh, that is where we really wanted to drive uh, specific and uh, very relevant content and allow the community to start consuming that uh, and also specifically putting it at a point where uh, it comes in at a 
reasonable enough cost so that the community can really uh, you know consume without having to literally break the bank like they used to have earlier so uh, luombo actually like i said already now has a 4g tower uh, run by amn the africa mobile network they're a, they're a specialist tower company that does a lot of rural uh, you know tower sites specifically tied up with larger telcos so that the uh, locations that the telcos themselves don't necessarily uh, want to go and put in their own infrastructure um, amn does that and you know they work with the telcos um, luombo itself does not have uh, a solid terrestrial bandwidth link so the remote site over there is working off a satellite backhaul which is by its very nature uh, a constrained network so what we have done is we have really started putting together in parallel with all of these other activities a highly replicable stack of um, everything needed in order to be able to run a local tower like this uh, starting all the way from the node b the um, epc uh, the radios um, then we also bring in the ability to have a cdn and caching component in that infrastructure and in all of this we then uh, enable various content partners to come in like we have someone like babu who is a uh, education content provider uh, you know who builds content for the zambian curriculum uh, we also don't want to only keep this as a very education focused initiative though education is a very large part of it we also wanted to be able to touch other parts and other members of the community so we have a commercial fm station uh, coming in as one of our content partners and uh, we are enabling them so that money fm uh, which also carries a lot of financial um, education and financial empowerment uh, content agricultural content uh, that is something that we want the community to have the ability to consume uh, we, we've also gone down the road of some religious content uh, because uh, you know uh, faith life is one of the partners there they're they're basically providing us access to a tonga version of the bible okay which is something which is again not very easy to access in that community uh, we're also working with virtual doctors so there's a health component of this and all of this is being basically brought together inside as compact a technical uh, uh, footprint as possible to keep the costs low um, and allow it to work even in a small community that doesn't necessarily have a large number of subscribers so when you can keep those costs low keep the technology uh, you know uh, simple enough so that a telco does not have to worry too much about saying hey uh, am i biting off more than i can chew by enabling such small uh, remote sites that i as a telco am not normally geared up to be able to support and manage which is why we are, uh, we have not gone into that before by putting this in front of them we answer that question and say hey uh, here's a tried and proven stack that's completely open that's available to you uh, that allows you to continue to operate and serve these communities at a much higher level without necessarily having to do a lot of changes in your network architecture and all of that um, so like i said luombo is pretty small less than 4000 residents in all um, so we've been very selective in terms of selecting our first set of partners because we want this to be our template and a big deliverable of this pilot project one obviously is the report that shows how digital utilization of resources grows and how much of an impact each of these various interventions that we have done in that community results in a bump in the usage and this is something that we intend to run over a reasonably long period of time we have like almost a two year two plus year uh, project uh, horizon for collecting data and you know making sure that uh, it's not just a short term bump that we see because of it's just something novel and new that the community sees we want 
we want there to be a sustained improvement in digital literacy and digital engagement in that community. Uh, in addition to what we are doing with the community themselves, we have also, uh, like I said, been working on the back end to make this entire tech stack highly replicable. So once we have this report and we have this uh, example tech stack ready, we can then literally go anywhere in the world, to any telco, okay, and say, hey, guys, let's start using this template to start going into communities that you have been hesitant to start serving up until now. Uh, so back to Kevin, I think uh, you can take us through some more of the fine grained details of exactly what we are doing in uh, you know, the schools in Luambo. Sure, and I'd just like to uh, to add some information that, that wasn't available at the time that we submitted our presentation. We're actually starting to see some analytics come in, even though this is early in implementation. It's not even fully implemented yet. There's certainly, you know, years worth of adoption work to be done, but we've seen already a 25% increase in usage in the community, and almost all of that's coming in that 4G space, which was almost non-existent, and this wouldn't have been possible without the M50 stack in place here. And so where we're seeing this happen is because the the applications are relevant to the community also not just as the service there but it's relevant in the schools and and they have now access to content and materials and online um, lessons and videos that they didn't have access to before um, same thing is true on the healthcare side where and this is especially true in a pandemic where where access was very distant not timely and not necessarily the right specialty or the right quality virtual doctors another n50 partner has been working here to help provide um healthcare services remotely and that's you know made made it much easier and much more timely for them to get services this is something we expect to see um increasing as well as as the adoption proceeds and on the next slide rajiv uh I want to talk for a moment about how important it is to, from the start, have have sustainability plans in place. It, it doesn't work if we just simply, through philanthropy or even through a good model, um, drop in equipment, if it isn't something that can be sustained by the community. And we believe fully that, that when it's relevant and the adoption measures are in place, that that itself helps to drive sustainability. But the business models have to be there. It has to be worthwhile for businesses to continue to invest in communities so that uh, the market opens up and that healthy market is a great sign of sustainability. So we, we set out specific uh, measurement indicators to let us know how we're doing in our work and how we're doing uh, in, in sustainability. Like I said, these early analytics coming in from Luumbo are very encouraging, but it's not the goal, right? The goal is, is much higher than, than just these initial these initial marks. So um, our, another hallmark of the Infinity project is while we're committed to communities, we're also committed to exit strategies, right? We don't we don't have an interest in 50 and being the provider for a long term. We want to turn this over to the market. And so we're looking for our way um, out before we ever get in so that this is not a dependency situation at all. Truly, the market develops and sustainability persists. And, and the persistence is towards the community defined goals, what they've said is important to them. Um, we, we don't come into it with any preconceived notions about what a community wants, but we do find similar things coming up over and over again. And they do center around education, healthcare, agriculture, financial literacy, and, and sometimes it's cultural priorities, even, even um, in the US, uh, uh, we find this with tribal nations, their sovereignty, their government services are hugely important. So um, common themes, but unique to each community. And then next slide. So we have released a white paper on this, uh, and I'll, I'll, I know that this uh, presentation is not something you can click on, so I'll, I'll pop it in the chat where you can see this white paper. Uh, we're already seeing the, the learning from this spread to other projects in Africa and other places around the world where other organizations are saying, hey, what you did there will work here. Let's try it in a context of agriculture. Let's try it in a context in Ghana, or let's look at what's happening in Zimbabwe and, and see how this might, um, might extend. So we encourage you to take a look at this. You can get more details than what we had just the time to, to cover today. And next slide, Rajiv. And I'll give you just a quick glimpse of where the Infinity project is going. Um, 
these are these are some dots of active and emerging projects. Um, we're beginning to have presence all around the globe. M50 Project is relatively new, formally launched in February. So this is a six month old organization, even though some of this pilot work we're talking about in, in Luumbo started almost a year before that, the ecosystem of partners is, is still kind of in full launch. So you'll see more projects in these areas and then hopefully more recipes being adopted from these projects into other communities. Next slide, Rajiv. Um, if you'd like to learn more, this is how. Um, m50project.org is our website. m50project.org slash join is how you sign up. And I, again, I mentioned there's no there's no uh, membership fees or annual dues. And and that's not necessarily a sales pitch because there's nothing to sell, but it is an indication of how we work. It's a, it's a coalition of the willing, and we ask partners to bring a project or support a project that works in the ways that we've said are important to communities. I think hopefully now we have time for questions. Yes, so looking forward to your questions, everyone. For your questions, do we have any takers? You've done such a wonderful job of the presentation. I don't see any. Oh, we have one for Leandro. <laughs> Leandro, you're up with a question. Hi, um, Jan. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by by the how much you achieved in in so short time uh, in, in the N50 project. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you already mentioned some some benefits, some impact. But um, given that you are uh, intending to to replicate the model. Um, you know, ICT technologies bring uh, a lot of benefits, obviously, but there are also some risks and some imbalances in the communities. Um, typically, I mean, technology, it's like a, uh, something magic for, for, for all of us and even more for the communities that are not used to uh, technology. And, um, and, and I was wondering about your, your experience about how how this introduction uh, I mean affects the, the, each community. It affects, for instance, the structure of power. The it 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 somehow helps to create um, new jobs, maybe in 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 creating local content or in um, in repairing, maintaining the infrastructure, uh, in in um, bringing some um, new opportunities like for instance uh, electricity brings light and then uh, there are some side effects as you mentioned also in health and everything um, have you thought about doing some kind of uh, formal let's say uh, independent analysis of the impact to, to make sure that the model is um, it's 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 um, it's as positive as possible or um, and as polished as possible um, while you replicate the model that is such an insightful question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I come to this work, Leandro, from 25 years working in K-12 education in the US. So from before the internet to, to times when now every student has access to a device and a computer. And we've seen the good, the bad, the better, the ugly, all of it. Um, it sort of begins with a, an understanding though that, that by not having access, while the world continues apace with access, these communities continue to be marginalized even more so. So the reality is the technologies are already impacting them in a negative way. And the only thing that can help to, to improve that is the technology. Uh, so applied in the correct way. So that's why we start with the community's um, goals and aspirations first, so that that's, that ends up being the focus of the outcomes for the communities. Um, but yes, there are things to mitigate, things to understand from the start, to to make it the best of what it can be and the least of the bad that it can be. Um, because technology in general will accelerate what you're already doing unless you purposefully make a shift in how it's applied. This is something we've learned over and over. So um, 
where, where some projects in the past may have, have stopped at the delivery of the service or the delivery of the device per se, uh, without follow on for digital literacy, which includes digital citizenship. Uh, it, it almost always ends poorly and, and, and worse for the community than if nothing were done at all. So that's why the heavy focus for our side on the adoption side of this on applications that are relevant to the community so that, that it begins with um, the good for them. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I have the question, I'm not trying to, to dodge the question about the analysis. I'm not sure how actually to, um, to approach that analysis except by looking at everything that we're doing and, and publishing all of the results uh, that we find. Um, and, and sometimes we have to learn as we're, as we're going what is and isn't working there. Um, but uh, uh, I think I think the best we can do at the moment is focusing on the positive outcomes that we can get, and knowing that that um, unmitigated it goes poorly. Um, and Leandro, if I'd like to kind of chip in, um, one of the very important decisions that we made, um, you know, like I said, very early on in the project, was um, to get our community liaison, our community manager, in place and talking to the community long before we had even started any of the technical work or the measurement work, because um, we know that unless the community feels involved and uh, a part of the process and not just a part of the execution, but a part of the planning end of the process, uh, there's never really going to be as much of a buy-in into the potential of what the project can deliver. Um, you know, then if someone literally kind of helicopters in drops a bunch of devices and some uh, tech in there and then just expects the community to figure stuff out on their own right so it was it was very important for us uh, which is why long before we got the first device or the first piece of tech in there we had a community manager we had multiple meetings with the community understanding what they wanted um understanding how to do something safely because um it, it, it may be as simple as deciding, okay, you're uh, you're not going to carpet bomb the entire community with 4,000 devices. We don't have the resources to do that. Uh, you're going to send a few hundred devices into, those, into that community. How do you send them in safely so that you don't have to worry about negative effects in that community? Uh, it, it may be something as simple as saying, hey, my neighbor received a, uh, a phone for free and I didn't. I'm jealous and, you know, that leads to a social... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, ang angle of all of this. So, you know, we had to do a lot of this uh, planning and, um, you know, uh, like, for example, one of the interesting things that we are doing in this community is uh, when we're sending devices out into the community, they go with a uh, agreement that someone who's receiving the device agrees to do certain things, to start learning certain skills, okay, using those devices as an enabler. So people don't feel that, hey, he's just getting something for free. He's he's committing to participate in the project. And that participation is what we really want to highlight um, as a part of our you know, uh, analysis and our report. And hopefully that uh, we hope that the results that come out of this entire exercise will really encourage others to follow this similar kind of highly participative model when they're trying to do for future projects. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very good answer. Um, I mean, uh, in in the research community, there is the uh, there is a, uh, there are conferences and and groups that work on uh, ICT for development. They they have experience in evaluating projects and um, and what you mentioned is it's really important. I, I fully agree. And I can see one one comment from Alian Farrell that um, in the chat. Maybe you can read it and. and I am it. going through that at the moment. Yeah, um, I had a chance I, to look at that while while you were responding, Leandro. Um, mm -hmm. um, Rajiv, let's let's uh, tag team this a little bit. Um, I would start with um, the the point that's made in it that we we may have come across as providing this only to leaders, technical teachers, and clinicians, and so forth. And I would just say the opposite is true, Adrian. I hope that this is something you can catch on the audio later. Um, it's very much about getting to the individuals um, and and. Uh, and, and sometimes we have to actually sort of uh, work with communities through that because sometimes their go-to is to give it to the leaders. And we generally insist more on, on making sure that it gets to the students, to the families, to the mothers, to the children and the communities. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I've seen in, in previous like um, uh, projects or research publications that they talk about the sense of ownership or the appropriation that, um, and that the difficulty to talk to everyone um, in, in, in the community without amplifying the imbalances, the imbalances that are already there. Like for instance, talking to the leaders means talking to people, to, to men, not to women, or uh, talking to uh, someone you are bring, giving them uh, some power and, and sharing this power between you and, and the community is, is tricky, uh, especially because you might be there for, for a very long time, but they are going to be there forever. And then um, as long as they see that as a critical resource that they manage and they decide or co-decide, then this is going to last more or less or um, help the community everyone in the community or not not some of them but yeah i mean this is intrinsically difficult uh challenge and uh and i was really happy to hear your approach i don't know if there are other comments in, in the in the room i see jane go ahead sorry it takes a bit of time with the audio um Thank you for the presentation. Um, and I would just like to add a, add a voice to your and support to the community-based approach. Uh, those that know me know that's uh, something I believe in very strongly. Um, I've been doing some work, not internationally, which was something I've been doing for 25 years, but doing some more domestic work in the United States recently. Um, and I'm, when, when I think you go into, um, a community, people often, as you say, can parachute in, right? And I've seen that when I worked in, in other communities overseas. And the parachute in approach just doesn't work. It doesn't bring that sustainability around. I really liked your point um, about working with a community across the community. Um, we've been, I work for a different organization now, but we're finding that when you, I used to work at the Internet Society, but um, we're finding that when you're looking at doing planning grants for getting money to do build out for community networks or small networks, um, that bringing in a variety of different actors across that community is critical from the very beginning. Um, you don't want a single point of failure in your network. You don't want single points of failure in your community <laughs> approach either. And so I, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation and um, very interesting. And as Adrian said, I'll, I too am going to take a stronger look at what you've been doing because I think there's a, there's a, a great approach here that can be integrated. Um, we're looking at doing some community readiness approaches. And I just wondered, have you found a good way to do a quick assessment of where communities might be with respect to the different learning tracks that you want to bring in? Because we're finding that we need to come in at a parallel approach now versus just a single tracked approach with sort of a, a linear value chain of effort. We, we're thinking that we need to come in with various different um, tracks of learning um, almost simultaneously. But I would love to hear your thoughts on sort of a readiness approach. Jane, I thank you for your, your comments and your questions um, for, for multiple reasons. Um, so thinking about, you know, how some organizations intentionally or unintentionally parachute in and parachute out of communities and how that doesn't work. Uh, we've specifically taken the opposite approach, as I think you've noticed. Um, I think this is most apparent when we were working with um, uh, tribal communities in the United States where um, simply gaining access to the to the community's challenge right it's very it's very insular and and proudly sovereign um and one of the first looks you get is who are you and how long will you be here and and very little happens until you prove that you will you will stay and be committed and so having been now involved over over years with the same communities helping them to identify grant opportunities build business strategies do implementation do adoption do sustainability um has has been has been a trust building you know operation that that, that allows us to then bring like-minded organizations to them to help further um and then uh, in terms of uh, project curation, I think I would love to come back and do a whole other session on project curation because we have some wonderful materials we've developed in partnership with with our, our, our team to um, 
to do that curation of community readiness, partner readiness, impact measurement, and so forth. There's actually a starter kit on our website that's available to anybody uh, if, if there's interest in that. But we could we could do another session and talk about how we how we bring projects in, into the fold. Thank you. That would be very, um, we could definitely consider that. Um, I should stop talking and see if there's anyone else that has um, a question or an observation. I think I just want to validate Leandro and Curtis. I don't think we have the other presentations from the perspective folks that we're going to also speak. So we may have more time to just have um, a Q&A with all of the participants who are here. Am I right about that, Leandro? Yes, uh, um, we haven't got slides uh, or the login, so so we gonna, we cannot expect more presentations today. But, but yeah, as, as you said, I think there's a, a nice opportunity to 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 talk talk about how the the uh, the three presentations we had how they could combine with each other. Maybe we can ask uh, the other presenters to reflect on what they what they saw here today, and then how their um, approach could combine or is different uh, similar from the others and and start a discussion about about the, the whole the whole um the three ways of uh of of addressing a common problem uh Yandre, i'd like to also bring up one point uh, you know that i thought would be interesting for us to also explore that is the possibility of you know identifying now entirely aside from the project and uh, you know the community and everything uh, purely on the technical side okay some of the challenges that we're overcoming um, in these environments uh, you know at a technical level both in terms of integration with telco networks as well as uh, you know uh, you know deep edge caching for content to make it more readily available to communities uh, in such challenging environments um, some of those technical solutions that come out of our project and all of the other projects that uh, you know we've been looking at uh, during this meeting uh, might also be a good foundation to you know think of in terms of some technical standards um, or at least te technical best practices guidelines um, work that can eventually turn into uh, an RFC um, at the IETF. So, you know, basically become um, a, a good template that can help people uh, really put together community networks. And um, if you could, you know, help connect us with wherever in the IETF work is happening around defining those community networking RFCs, uh, you know, we'd really love to see what we can do there in terms of contribution. Mm -hmm. Good point. So let's, let's see, I mean, what the others uh, say about uh, these two ideas and and how we can elaborate on the on the group on the collective um, effort on or a collective set of presentations today. For instance, uh, you, you mentioned uh, in the first presentation there was mention of uh, satellite uh, based community networks. I don't know. For instance. Um, your own your own experience about that, or, or the case of of uh, Philippines. Also, there was some part in satellite, as as you said, Rajib. Uh, there are many uh, technical solutions out there, um, and uh, well, I have to say that RFCs are not the best uh, marketing tool, but. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so so I, I I'm basically thinking of them beyond um, a marketing tool. But um, like like we said, it, at the N50, we we are very uh, you know focused on building recipes that are reusable. We want to build solutions both in terms of process as well as in terms of technology that basically make uh, projects like this a much lower risk and much faster implementation to the community over time because that's i believe the only way we'll uh, make a dent on uh, the problem um, the scale of the problem as we see hmm. yeah I, I mentioned the term marketing but not in the terms of selling products but uh, about, about selling ideas is that usually rfc's work uh, across the technical community 
but they are not really designed to be, uh, let's say, uh, read or understood by people outside our technical community. But yeah, it's an instrument. Uh, several years ago in, in Gaia, we developed one RFC uh, reporting about the technological options at that time and discussing about it. And uh, I think it was helpful to realize well the differences and the, and the commonalities. Uh, but at the same time, when you think about uh, community networks, um, it's difficult to come up with the specific um, uh, challenging problems that the technical community can solve um, globally, but there are solutions and the, the solutions are more or less adapted to to, uh, to community networking environments. You, you can see in the ITF some work about um, uh, like uh, low rate connections or, or routing or, uh, or energy related. Um, so, so but yeah, I mean, uh, collecting this information, as you said, would re reduce the the risk, in uh, and and would um, facilitate new initiatives to al al at least be aware of the experiences and learn from the mistakes, learn from the successes, and I, yeah, it would be nice to somehow be able to summarize the technical lessons, but also the other uh, lessons, um, governance lessons and, and and economic lessons from other initiatives in a compact manner so it would be uh, reusable uh, and as, a, as an organizational memory um, for, for other initiatives. Any other comments about this, uh, around this? My only comment, Leandro, would be to reinforce um, the collaborative nature of the Infinity project we believe better together and we don't see anything but compatibility with everything else we saw today. Um, different communities need different technical solutions. They need different adoption solutions. And, and the more we have um, at the ready, the better we can serve our communities. Yeah. And by the way, I just taking a couple of minutes uh, uh, for you to know um, the ITF has too many parallel meetings and, and working meetings uh, just from my agenda tomorrow. Uh, at the same time as today, there is one uh, another research group. It's called uh, ICN, Information Centric Networking. That is a technical group that focuses on 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 um, on information centric networks, networks oriented to content. Also at uh, seven, well, in my seven thirty. So uh, in in two hours from now, uh, tomorrow, or one and a half hours from now, is the uh, HRPC, the Human Rights. Uh, in, in, in protocols uh, uh, working group and also later on is the decentralized um, internet uh, research group that also um, touches topics which are connected to this i don't know if anyone in the audience wants to comment about any of these uh, upcoming uh, meetings no. kevin uh, it might make sense if you want to talk a little bit about some of what the entity is doing in ukraine right now because that is all probably also tying into some of these, uh, you know, topics that Leandro just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I'd be happy to. Um, and and the work we're doing in and around Ukraine is sort of the other end of the spectrum, if you will, to to have a pun on that, uh, where it's a completely different solution that we're we're working on there. So, um, folks who are displaced or are leaving Ukraine are in the millions and uh, they're highly mobile, but they they are also edge um, uh, and, and marginalized people. So we set out at the at the um, at the start of the conflict to deploy what we call PCCs, which which is um, um, portable connectivity centers. And these are shipping containers that are purpose built to have uh, network gear included in them. You can put them anywhere. They have solar panels and diesel generators. You can connect them to anything from satellite to um, to a local MNO, to ethernet, to fiber, and, and they can be moved and reconnected as the situation changes on the ground. So um, knowing that these were coming into um, that type of a context, knowing that we are still in a pandemic, these are essentially not internal shelters, they're external radiation <laughs> areas where where the, the service is provided around the containers and the, the equipment is kept inside. We have multiple partners participating in this, almost none of them put their logos on it. It's strictly a, 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 a philanthropic effort, though substantial 
um, resources were committed to it uh, to provide computers, to provide the network connectivity uh, as we go around, to provide um, the, the on-site staffing. We're working with World Vision to deploy 10 of these containers right now, um, some four weeks uh, after the first ideation occurred, we had the first container in place in Bucharest, Romania to support refugees. Now what we're finding is that the, the demand is increasing for these these uh, containers pretty substantially, where we can provide government services, where we can provide health care, where continuing education can occur, where wayfinding services can occur, just where am I and how do I get, get to the next place on my journey? And so we're working with um, various ministries in Ukraine and around Ukraine to um, to make these uh, a semi-sustainable solution uh, until more permanent um, resolution occurs to the to the conflict there. So um, that's 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 the other type of thing that we do. Uh, I, I could go through ten other type of projects and tell you how they're all different, but you start to see um, how how the the weight of these different organizations can be brought to bear on almost any challenge and, and rather quickly when they work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, what you mentioned, for instance, is connected to the this um, uh, computer aid project on solar learning labs. And yes, um, yes. that that we're in touch um, since seven years ago. We, we are actually, we have some students now in, in South Africa these days uh, preparing for, for this one solar learning lab in in a place uh, in the community there, and uh, I also share the link of this community network exchange that, um, that is happening these days in in India as well. So uh, it's really comforting to see so many so many activities around. So I think we are getting uh, close to the end of the session. I wonder if um, if uh, Curtis or Jane want to comment anything else and, and close the session. Uh, sure. Uh, first, thanking all the presenters. These were fantastic, good discussions and so much synergy between them. Um, hopefully you all can chat with each other. Um, and I'll be sending some reach out emails for our own work, which I think similarly dovetails well. Uh, I want to also call out the note takers. Um, uh, I think uh, of particular uh, uh, value was, was Nick, who seems to have done a bunch of writing. So thank you so much. Uh, for that, but of course there were other folks uh, as well. So anyone who jumped in and provided a little bit more context for the folks um, who aren't going to be uh, or who couldn't be here uh, live in this uh, hybrid world we live in, uh, great thanks for that. Um, and lastly, is probably just a call out for any other talks people want to give. I think um, this is a great venue for people to share their work um, and to get more feedback from uh, outside of whatever bubble uh, we all individually live in. Um, it was great to see some of the different ecosystems at play here uh, and, and different countries and different perspectives on connectivity. Uh, so, um, Jane, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Seeing Jane pop up and not hearing anything. showing no kilobits a second, which might be a problem. I'll assume Jane doesn't have much to add. Um. Uh, okay, now it's coming through. It's it's funny, it took a good 30 seconds. But um, no, just to thank everybody, to echo um, what Curtis and Leandro have both said, and to thank everyone for their presentations, and um, to just echo Curtis's invitation for more um, uh, data presentations, collaboration, and we'll be back at you on the Gaia list. So join the Gaia list if you haven't. Um, and uh, we welcome lots of dialogue on that list. It's been a little quiet um, over the last couple of months, but we'll re reinvigorate that. And I just to sort of put something on the clipboard that um, came up during the conversation is this discussion about what community networks are. And I think Peng had a good point about satellite related integration of networks with you know, terrestrial based other. And I think it would be great for us to explore what um, the RFC that we've uh, already got in place, but to maybe elaborate on that or hack a new one together. So otherwise, um, thanks everybody for your time and for hanging in there with us throughout the almost two hours. And the, it was a great, it was a great opportunity to hear more from others around the planet. So thanks so much, and we'll call it a a day for now or an evening for some. Y'all next guy. Yeah. <laughs> See you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye and take care.
，拜拜。